was born in 1926. What were the years you attended Stutzman Elementary? Uh, I started in 1931 and finished in, uh, it was a high school then, and I finished in 1942. Twelve years going to Stilson School was like heaven to me. We were just one great big family. We loved everybody. We had, it was just such a wonderful atmosphere. Uh, we had great students. We had people. My my friends that I had in high school are still my friends. Uh, some of the best ones in the world. Well, Stilson is next to heaven. <laughs> no, uh, it was a, a big, big school. It got, it was big, and everybody had a good time. What years did you attend Stilson? So I began in 1940 and graduated in 52. I went to school here in 1936. I went to started school. Oh, I started the first grade and I was in the last graduating class in 1955 of Stilson High School. 46, I think it was. 46, 7, 8, 9. I, I, I was here about uh, what, four years, five years. You know, it consolidated, so that's, that's my time here at Stilson. I walked to school because we lived next door and my daddy had to make what we used to call it. Well, it was steps up over the fence and down the other side, and that's how I came to school. I had to cross over the fence. And I couldn't ride the school bus because I lived too close to the school. You had to walk to school. And uh, believe it or not, you boys and girls, we came to school barefooted. We didn't know what shoes were until, uh, you know, it still got too, too cold. I started here in first grade in 1953. We had teachers of the greatest magnitude, grades one through 12, some of the most, the greatest teachers that could have been during that period of time. They were dedicated to us, they taught us, they were there, and they really did. We had a, an excellent education when I did, when I finished high school here in 1952, and so did my classmates. My mother kept uh, teachers. They had the teachers that came in from different places. And at one time she had five, and she had seven children, and we were all in one house. It was a big house. But, and one of the, the teachers that stayed with us was uh, my fourth grade teacher, and I went home with her. And we had a very good class of people. The, the children in my class, the boys and the girls, they were just, became outstanding and were outstanding citizens from wonderful families here in the community. Stilson was a community school. I mean, everybody here upheld, upheld everybody else. We were not mostly farmers, dirt farmers. That means getting out there and hoeing with a hoe <laughs> and getting the grass out of the peanuts and suckering the tobacco by hand and picking it and I strung it and yes, and I hung it in the barn and I took it out of the barn and I knew how to cure it. My brothers were too right ahead of me. They went into, they had to go to the army. So that left me there, the only one left with my father who was getting on up in age and my mother, he had cataracts. So I had to be not only the girl, but I had to be the boy, the man, too. <laughs> can you tell us what you know about the old log cabin? Oh, I can tell you a lot about that old log cabin. Some of it you don't need to hear. <laughs> oh, the log cabin was built in the uh, late 1930s and built by the community with the community help to uh, secure the logs that they made out of. Those logs came off of a farm right here in the community and a pastor, Mr. Charlie Lee's farm. He donated all those logs to build that cabin. But uh, it was built like that old tobacco barns used to be built. The log tobacco barns back in that time period, uh, they were sort of notch them out and fit the logs and see which one goes where and 
make sure the crook is in the right position and everything. Once it was built, then they uh, then they made the uh, uh, inside of it smooth uh, with some tight boards, and uh, and then they would daub it, and we call daubing the cracks on the outside okay. with sort of a cement mixture, either with clay mm -hmm. or uh, something of that nature to seal the outside of it. And later on now, I believe somebody mentioned something, why was it red? Yes, sir. Uh, later on when the logs started uh, to uh, disintegrate, then it was painted to preserve that. Okay. It was built for the, uh, what we called it then, the soup kitchen. They, uh, they, that was when they first started serving lunch at uh, schools. And uh, I remember the first, uh, first lunches that I ate there, it was in a, a cup, uh, something like a big coffee cup. It hold about a pint. And our first lunch was vegetable soup and soda crackers. And uh, I believe they charged us a nickel at that time for that cup of soup. That building was built in 1937 and it was part of the WPA program. And I think it had something to do not only with the work effort at, in the depression years, but it also had something to do with the um, putting high school courses like agriculture and home economics in the school. And lunch rooms were not part of the original construction of the school. Most children brought their lunches to school on a, if you had lunch. So a lot of kids didn't bring anything. People didn't have a lot of money. It was, and they had to do without a lot. She, uh, She'd make biscuit sandwiches for us if we didn't have any bread. <laughs> the only original building that's left here on this campus is the log cabin. Um, there were, there was an old gym that was originally here. There was the log cabin that was here. There was a main building that was a brick building. I think you have pictures of that. There was an audio visual room. And I remember the cannery. I don't remember the cannery operating, but the building was still here when I attended elementary school. I think my mother came here in the summertime and canned vegetables for the family. Okay. That's the part I remember. Okay. Uh, they probably taught us canning, too. Okay. I think I already knew some of the basics of canning, but uh, I'm sure we learned a lot, too. Tell us what you know about the log cabin. Oh gosh, the log cabin has lots of fine memories. Um, some associated with eating lunch. Um, our first, uh, my first recollection was the lunches that we had there. I remember one of the things that was a staple on the lunch menu was uh, lima beans with a tomato sauce and cornbread. We had that just about every day on our plate. And the other thing that was always constant was a bottle of milk. Came in a bottle, a small bottle, and then later we had it in glasses. And I had a glass uh, milk dispenser that you got. I remember the lunchroom ladies at that particular time uh, was Miss Upchurch, Miss Warnick, and Miss Finling. There were three ladies that worked in the lunchroom. But the log cabin, we would have to run over to lunch because we were in the old building and it was not a breezeway or anything. You had to get out in the weather and run across. That was about the only time they wanted us to run, but they'd encourage <laughs> us to run to lunch. And I remember when they put the milk machine in, Now you all don't have one of those, I don't think now. That's the past, <laughs> you get the little cartons, right? Mm -hmm. And some of the boys were real funny because they had cows at home and they knew how they got milk. This was new to us, you know, and we enjoyed that. As I recall, we had a lot of lunches that and served some some vegetables that I had never heard of in my life. You know, born and reared down here in South Georgia, 
there was something, and it's delicious, and I eat it today, and you probably do too, called asparagus. Now, when they first served that to us, our home ec teacher had to prime us up a little bit before the, we saw that on our plate because it looked like sticks. It looked <laughs> like stems out of a tree. And I'm like, what the heck is this stuff? And it tasted just about as bad. But after, and we were taught in home economics, we gotta eat, we gotta do this vitamin thing, and this thing, and this is what we got. So we were real big on doing what we supposed to do, you know, so we all, sample that asparagus and pretty soon we were eating it and loving it. We also, in about the eighth or ninth grade, we began having home economics classes here in, in the log cabin building. Home ec is like learning how to do household things and cook, we were supposed to learn how to cook and sew a little bit. Agriculture was taught on the right-hand side of that until they constructed a shop that was on the end of the old gym. And they moved the agriculture building or classes over there, but the home ec, as Ms. Sanders, Judge Sanders was saying, was in that building. And then in the later years after there was no high school and the lunchroom was moved to the old building, they didn't have to run out in the rain, but we did. And the uh, your, your great-grandfather put restrooms in there for us and we could come over and we had dances. I remember people coming and teaching art lessons in there and you're gonna love this. The best part was on Saturday night they had a band and we all went and had dancing. <laughs> went dancing in the log cabin. So the community and a lot of those community members that are here today played in that band. So it was just a local little group that got together and Mr. Wayne Swint played drums and Kenny Robertson sang and I can't remember who the other people were but every Saturday night they played over there and you could go and get a ticket. Um, they give you, you paid a little bit to go in, it wasn't very much, but it was a big community thing with the young people in the community. Was there a playground? Was there like playgrounds? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Out back of me where the parking lot pretty much is for buses and things, we had playgrounds and we had these big swings. And actually, I guess I can tell this, they used to have a coal pile out there. And the reason was because in the heat of the school we had coal burning heaters. And we had no heat until we boys got together gathered up enough coal and wood or whatever to build a fire in the coal heaters. And usually by dinner time we had enough heat in the, <laughs> in the uh, classroom to be reasonably warm. But we would come every morning and be a cold classroom to come to until we had the fire going. That's why you so like to yeah. seat in the back of the room that was close to the heater. <laughs> could you, could you uh, like the boys in Luckham, could you like do the fire? Would they let the kids do the fire? Oh yeah, we we boys built the fire. Now they were probably high school when you were. We were that, no, though. we were in upper grammar school, seventh and eighth graders, and in the high school. And then after the years when they got gas heat and so forth, the coal pile diminished, but it was still there. And we used to play war, you know, get behind the thing. And you had to be really careful. You weren't supposed to throw coal at anybody. It did happen a time or two, but that was part of our history here too, getting around the coal pile. And we used to play jump board. Oh my, that was something. It was just a log across a log, I guess. And, and we didn't have, like you have, factory-made equipment to play on. We didn't have that. We had, we had fun, though. We had slides, and we had swings, and we had those jump boards. We used to play hide-and-seek in this area, and it was a wonderful hide-and-seek refuge, a place to hide and to seek. A lot of shrubbery around it, and we could get around it, and so I remember a lot of games of hide-and-seek. And I used to do the cartwheel, and I could start here at this school, and I didn't stop until I went out in my, uh, how our house then still up, up down the road there. And I could go right up the stairs, and my daughter, my sister, would open the front door, and I would go in doing cartwheels. So when I got to be 80 years old, I told them I was going to do a cartwheel. 
and all of them didn't like it, and, but I did it. I did three. <laughs> and I think I could do it again, but they won't let me. Very good members of uh, playing basketball. That was the only sport we had. We had a little bit of baseball, of course, no football, mm -hmm. but basketball was just like Mr. Davis said, seven days a week, year round. There was a goal out in front and uh, it was clay and you got dirty. Mm -hmm. But we played and we had to fight the boys off. <laughs> Stilson, Nevels, and Brooklyn. Anytime any of those combinations of teams played, it was always a packed gym. I have played basketball before, playing Nevels or either Brooklyn, and there would be so many people in the gym until the court would be lined, and you would have to push people aside in order to stand outside the boundary to throw the basketball back in. And it was really a community activity for the three schools. It was, I believe we had about three uh, state tournaments state uh, championships. Uh, I know we had did in 1942, the year I graduated. We won the state that year. And if my memory is, uh, serves it right, I, I, I believe we only lost one game that year. And, uh, and that was to uh, Statesboro, I believe. And uh, the only reason we lost that, uh, we were anticipating a meeting with Brooklyn. If we had won that game, we would have played Brooklyn. And that was, uh, uh, would have been uh, uh, a real memory because it was hard to get, we had to quit on the count of the, uh, uh, People looking at the game would get in fights and they decided it was better to not play each other for a while. And the last game that we played with Nevels, I guess it would say it's still going on because it ended in a fight and we had to discontinue the game before it was in, ended. So uh, there was no winner. There was no, no winner at the last game we played Nevels. We also won the state basketball championships boys and girls in 1952. Uh, that was a first in the history of the state of Georgia for the boys team and the girls team in the same class, C, to win the state basketball tournament. In 1951, they cons uh, changed from 11 grades to 12 grades. Our uh, the class of 1952 was the first class to graduate with 12 years. So we were that first 12th year of uh, uh, students. How many people in your family attended school in the law cabin? Oh gosh, my dad attended school in that cabin. Um, all of his children, so that would have been seven of us, and my children to school there. They all went to kindergarten in a lot of In the early 70s, I became involved in politics, and I served on the Board of Education for eight years, chairman for seven of those eight years. And at that time, there was a drive to consolidate and to move or to close Stilson School. And it was very, very, very important to me to keep Stilson School, but yet at the same time, I had to keep an open mind because I was chairman for the Board for Bullock County. But we did, we were able to maintain and keep Stilson School. Later on, it was the, in 1994, I guess it was, the old school was demolished, a new school was built. And Stilson School has continued to be a very important part of this community. And I hope and pray that it will continue to be because we need community schools. Were y'all mad when they built a new school like they tore down the old one? That's a good question. I'm sure, and I have friends in all three communities. Uh, that's a very good question. I think it was a mixed emotion. You didn't want to lose your school, because it's personal, you know, that's life, that's here. And I could walk to school, you know, that was the fun part. After a few years, it wasn't so much fun. But I think there were mixed emotions when we combined the schools. 
But like I said, the class I was in, we were very fortunate because we all kind of melded together, made friends from each of the three communities, and we built our own, uh, our own little community at Southeast Bullock. And it's a very good school. I taught there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was around 1980 they began to put in a kindergarten program in this county. And as part of the kindergarten, it was a half-day program, but you could send your children and they could stay all day. Well, the kindergarten classroom was in that log cabin. And then when I became principal, this, this community really began to grow. I think there were only about 260 kids here. When I came, when I left, 12 years later, there were 623 kids. And as part of that, we began to have to use the log cabin as a regular classroom again. So there were not only a kindergarten, there began to be two kindergartens out there. And then all of a sudden, we had to have mobile units all over the campus. We had more mobile units on this campus than we had regular classrooms in a main building at one point. And the community got together, very concerned. This gentleman back here would have been part of that. Uh, to build a school in this community. And um, the challenge was, as Ms. Sanders said, there was a lot of history with that old building. And so one of the things that was the challenge was, how do you preserve the history? Because the reason people came back to the school was that old gym, the Halloween fall festivals that were in there, the log cabin in the People came back to this community because there were so many good experiences that they had. When I became principal, the, you, all of that end of the campus was filled with privet, which is a type of shrubbery, had grown up all around that building. And part of the challenge or, was that over the years, the water ran from that big building down toward that branch that's down there, and the water ran up under that building and out of the campus. So when I realized all those logs were beginning to be deteriorating, I got involved in trying to get it cleaned up. And so community members, my PTO, came out, and we all pitched in, and we cleaned that. We bulldozed that, all that shrubbery off the end. And then I began to see how bad the logs were, and that was when I began to get involved with the Historical Society. Was there any way to replace those logs on the bottom of that cabin? And that was before we were using it for a lot of major classrooms. There was actually, at one point in my career, we had to have a fourth grade class out there too. So anyway, uh, when I checked, the way to repair that log cabin was you had to lift the log cabin and find the exact kind of log <laughs> to go back in under there. So the best bet was to just see if we could contour the campus so that the water would not run under that log cabin and deteriorate it further, which we were able to do by rerouting the water more over toward the drainage in front by bringing in some people who could contour the campus a little bit and keep the water from running under. So if you wanted to ask me why is that important, I think at the point that I was here, it was the only log cabin that had classes in it in the state of Georgia. But I had attempted to try to get that building repaired at that point. And nobody wanted to take on trying to lift those old logs and replace the bottom logs. Because you had to find the logs that would be pretty close to that log that you were gonna replace, but they were all concerned about lifting the logs because it's chinked. Right. And once you start lifting it, you break the chinks and all the other logs. What is one of your last memories from the log cabin? Well, like I say, Miss, Miss Irma Lee teaching us health, and she had, she was a, she had a baby during the time that she was teaching us, and Chuck Lee lives over by, you know Chuck lives by me over there, that was her baby, at the time. And she'd bring the baby to school with her, teaching, and the girls in my class would babysit the baby for her to teach. You know, Seriously? That would be cool. <laughs> well, really, they did. I mean, that's just what they did. Why do you want to save the lock cabin? Well, if you're taking everything away from Stilson, there won't be a Stilson. It'll just be a little tiny town. It's already getting smaller, and I think it should uh, preserve them.
all the buildings that were the old, any town, if they can. Yep. It was a lot of memories for a lot of people in that building. Why do you think the log cabin holds such a special place in your heart in the Stiltson community? Well, me personally, I, I feel like I'm, I'm part of it. I think it's... I think it has the handiwork of this community in it. I think those logs, they were placed there by community. I think it was the commitment of the community to have a school here. This community is a very, has a very, um, at that point in time, was a very, the church was the foundation of the community. Everybody was in agriculture, and those values were transferred into the commitment to those schools and to their children to provide the kind of facility for them to attend. And they did, they taxed, they put forth that money themselves. Why do you want to save the log cabin? Well, I, I, yes, I want to save it as long as it's feasible. And uh, I think it's something that uh, is part of history. Uh, of course, as time goes on, the, the only history they have is a, the hand down like we're doing today. And, uh, but I'd like to preserve that as long as we can, as long as it's feasible. It is over in the corner of, a, of, a, of the school property, and I don't see where it's hindering anybody and uh, to keep it as a as part of history and uh, as time goes on why these things are going to uh, disappear more or less just like Stilson School is now. <clears throat> See the one that this school replaced it was 11th grade school and uh, now it's a elementary school so the history of the Stilson School is sort of going along in the, in, the, uh, in the past history, old history. Why do you want to save the log cabin? Of course, it would be um, a great uh, historical marker. I do not know anything about um, the present state condition. I have no idea what it would cost to put it back in pristine condition. Uh, it, it would have to weigh upon all those issues being resolved, uh, but I would be for it 100% to preserve it, to maintain it, to build it back to where it was, if, if it's not prohibitive right. from cost. If we can raise enough money, I don't know how you go about raising money, but people raise tons of money, they so do. perhaps we could. Well, it's been around a long time. It was here when I come to Stilson years ago, and uh, I just hate, I like to see things preserved, you know, keep, just keep it, it's, it's been here a long time. And I, well, I will work to try to keep it, you know, uh, to have, we'll have fundraisers and whatever it takes to keep it going, I, I like to see it stay where it's at. You know what? It's history. And if we don't save and preserve history, then you young people come along you will have no memories or no knowledge of what we had when we came along. So it's very important to preserve history. And history may be good, history may be bad. History may be something that you don't want to talk about, <coughs> but history is something you cannot change, it's happened. And so the log cabin was a part of our school years. The log cabin was here for us to have lunch. <coughs> the log cabin was there for the girls at that time to go in and have home ec. Later on, it became a community center. We had dances there. So the log cabin has many memories for all of us here in the Stilson community. Yes, it should be preserved. Hopefully it will be. I doubt, seriously, that in Bullock County you'll find another log structure that large. I think it's probably the largest that I've ever known about, actually, here in Bullock County. And uh, I would love to see it become a community center again. I see a lot of possibilities, like a lending library. We wouldn't have to come into the school for it. They can put up a, a little box outside with books in it and you know you just come and get them as you'd like or put some in for others to share and a place to gather for just a supper if we wanted to say hey let's meet over at the log cabin and have supper tonight. 
it'll take some doing to do that and legalities will be an issue. But I think it's a possibility. You know, there's no saying where there's a will, there's a way. So we're gonna hope for that. But I went by to see Miss Laura Michael the other day. You know, I walked in, she said, Robert Smith. <laughs> That's a pretty good I said, I said, you, yeah, yeah, her mind is sharp. I said, you remember me? She said, good, Lord, I will never forget you, Robert Smith. She said, you talked all the time. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with talking. <laughs> In 1942, when I was had to come up to prepare for a ball game that night, we would stay over. I would stay over after school, and uh, my family would give me a give me a, a, a dime to uh, buy lunch with at the store. And uh, with that dime, I would uh, buy me a sweet roll. We called them back then. It was about the size of a eight or nine inch dinner plate and uh, with white icing on it. And that cost a nickel. Well, it, I had a nickel left. So I bought a three center. They had a drink called a three center. It was a cola and uh, about the size of a Coca Cola bottle. It was six or seven ounces, something like that, for three cents. The other two cents, I got it in two cents worth of mixed candy. <laughs> I'd get a handful now for two cents. And that was my lunch for, <laughs> to play ball on that night. What do y'all think you could buy for a dime for lunch? A pickle? <laughs> Maybe a pickle out of a jar? Not even a pickle. Not even a pickle. Nothing. They would spank you. And in fact, I got a couple of them. <laughs> These spanks would paddle about that long, about that wide with holes in it. School whipping. Do they, do they like slap? Your that wasn't funny. I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, I got one whipping. I, the whole time I was in school was one whipping. And that was it. So I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell my daddy, you whipped me. He said, that's what I want you to do, son. Then you tell your daddy I whipped you. Spanked you at school. So I go hold it and I tell my daddy. He said, oh, you got a whipping at school? I said, yes, sir. And I thought my dad was going to jump on the teacher, but he didn't. See, I deserve the whipping. Then he said, you deserve the whipping? Then he whipped you. But that will happen today, see. That, that's a thing of the past. You don't whip a child today. Was the worst day that you got spanking? Was that the worst day of school? <laughs> no, I, I've had, I, I had a lot of bad days. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of bad days. That wasn't nothing. That, I had a lot of bad days. Well, what was your worst day? Good, son. I, I don't really know. Uh, I don't know. He's uh, just like anybody else. I, I, want to come. I, I, did, I didn't want to come to school, right. But uh, Daddy made me come to school. Yep, just like Mama mentioned. <laughs> and and if, I, if I told my mother I was sick, you know what she'd do? No, 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 give me a dose of castor oil. <laughs> Which might be the worst. Ah. The worst thing you'd worry you take is castor oil. If you ever took it, I don't know you took it. You know what castor oil is? No, uh, I'm talking. Yeah. It's a thick medicine that you. And nowadays, if you don't go to school, you, you're wrong. <laughs> and, and then most of the when Dad come home, he, he, if she told him I stayed home from school, he'd spank me. So I, so I didn't stay home. I didn't stay home too many times. <laughs> I taught anything from kindergarten through twelfth grade. I had taught except eighth grade. I never got the opportunity to teach eighth grade. And I've taught every subject pretty much in some course of my being a teacher. They wouldn't let me do that today. But I learned something in that process. I learned that fifth, sixth, and seventh graders spent more time hunting stuff than they did learning. So I convinced the principal the last year I taught here, I wanted to teach seventh grade. I wanted to be self-contained. And I wanted to teach them every subject. And I taught them. I taught them writing. They created a lot of writing. I still have some of the books they created. I taught them science. We actually did science in the experiment. So I taught them everything. That way, the only thing I had, which is the only thing you'll ever have in life that's equal to anybody else's time. You're given 24 hours, and you spend that time, and that's how effective you'll be in life, is how you spend those 24 hours. The Stilson community always supported the Stilson School. Very, very welcome, uh, supported by the community. Whatever school was good, basketball, uh, the fall festival, Halloween, the uh, senior play, the piano recitals, the Stilson community 
showed up for the support here at the Silson School. Just, just, all you got to do is get a good education right here. Go on to your higher education, set your mind for a something that you could enjoy doing. Get, get, get an education, son. That's right. If you get, get your education, they can't nobody take it away from you. And do that and dedicate yourself to becoming a worthwhile citizen and a wife and a mother and whatever we might have in mind. Everybody doesn't have to be a wife and a mother. There's other outstanding things women can do in this day and age. So just as I used to say, just be something, something good, something worthwhile.